Just about uh, 24 years ago, in December 1991, the Soviet Union, long-time Cold War adversary, collapsed. Um, in that same month, there were meetings in Washington area with uh, Secretary of Energy Admiral Watkins. And Watkins expressing concern about the possibility of brain drain asked what can be done to keep Soviet scientists there. <coughs> Dr. Hector responded, why don't we go ask them? A set of visits was proposed with Russian lab directors visiting here and U.S. lab directors going there. And the Russians agreed to this proposal. And the lab directors' exchange visits took place just a few months later in February 1992, with the Russian lab directors going first to Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory and then to Los Alamos. Later that month, the directors of Los Alamos and Livermore, Sig Hecker and John Knuckles, went to Russia, the first meeting in the Institute of Technical Physics in Snezhensk, and then in the Institute of Experimental Physics in Sarah. Out of these visits, and based on the written understandings from these and subsequent meetings, but much more importantly, from the trust built on personal relationships, there developed a most remarkable program of science and technology collaboration. These interactions were unprecedented between former existential enemies. The exchanges involved thousands of scientists and engineers and it made a difference. It mattered. And even more than science, these interactions had a very personal aspect. Friendships formed and still endure. A sister city's relationship was established. As many visits between members of the communities of Sarov and Los Alamos occurred. Students and whole families were engaged. Given one example, six wife Nina had organized deliveries of local knitted baby blankets and hats to the children's hospital in Sarov. But now, as the tide of relations between Russia and the U.S. take another bizarre turn, this incredible story needs to be told, and now more than ever. And who better to lead this history-writing undertaking than the man whose vision, courage, persistence, and even personal sacrifice, more than any other, made it all happen? Who better to tell us about this massive effort than the former director of Los Alamos National Laboratory, and now professor and senior fellow at Stanford University, Dr. Sig Hecker. Thanks. Am I live? Can you hear me in the back? I feel sorry for all of you folks way back there. I, I have a lot of visuals, uh, and if at any point uh, I go through them too fast, or if you can't quite see them, please uh, raise your hand. So uh, Paul, thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, Paul set the stage for what I'm going to talk about. And it's, it is about this remarkable adventure, uh, primarily uh, of the three US nuclear weapons laboratory, Los Alamos, Lawrence Livermore, and Sandia National Laboratories. Uh, and especially what I'm going to talk about is the effort uh, of the scientists, the engineers, the technicians, the professionals uh, who all contributed uh, to this effort. L let me just start by asking uh, of the Russian-related activities, Russia and also the other former states of the Soviet Union, how many of you here in this room worked on those efforts at one time or another? have the credits, either up front or in the back, we'd spend the rest of the hour uh, just giving credits. Uh, I'm going to explain the title, uh, because to capture this activity, what we decided to do, uh, the Russians uh, and ourselves, was to write a book. Actually, I started out by proposing uh, to one of my Russian lab director colleagues to write an article. Uh, and eventually, he said, no, 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 there's so much we have to write a book. So that was five years ago. So we've been working on this for five years. And eventually, we came to this title of Doomed to Cooperate. 
It sounds sort of catchy, but then maybe also uh, you know, somewhat gloomy. But let me just explain a bit where the title came from, and that is, as I will point out to you, the, the Russians were more eager to cooperate with us near the dying days of the Soviet Union than we were getting across to them. And I could never quite understand why were they so eager? You know, because back during Soviet Union days, and certainly uh, even a couple of years after, um, back in the old days, that could have cost them a lot, uh, you know, for sort of crossing that bridge. And they did. And so Lev Ryabev, uh, who was the first deputy minister uh, of atomic energy, what's called Minatom, he explained it to me in an interview the uh, year before last. And he said, you know, Sig, we already understood near the end of the Soviet Union that just keeping and continuing to build nuclear weapons just doesn't make any sense. You know, he said, we all arrived in the century, in the nuclear century together in one boat. And if anyone rocks that boat, you know, everyone will suffer. So he said, we knew that anyone's accident, be it nuclear power reactors, be it nuclear weapons, is everyone's accident. And we knew that we had to work together, and so we were doomed to work together. So that's the way they felt already near the end of the Soviet Union time. So I thought it would be appropriate uh, to call it doomed to cooperate, and how the American uh, and the Russian scientists worked together to revert what looked like was going to be the perfect nuclear storm, and that is when the Soviet Union broke up and the threats changed, you know, from possible annihilation of each other with the weapons that were in the government's control to now being worried about what happens if the weapons, the materials, and the people get out of the government's control. And so those were the new threats at the end of the Soviet Union. So that's what this book uh, is all about. And so, in the end, this book turned out to be um, quite an adventure. Five years ago, uh, we started, especially the last few years, uh, have been uh, quite an effort. And there are many people in this room who helped out. There are quite a few uh, here who contributed articles. And people like Paul White uh, was particularly enormously helpful uh, to me uh, to get as far as we have uh, with the book. So it, it turns out it's going to be two volumes. Uh, and uh, we, in essence, we lay out the foundation for how did we get to work together. Uh, and then we feature nuclear weapon safety and security, the things we did together to make sure uh, that we could ensure nuclear weapon safety and security. Then nuclear materials security. And from on, on there to volume number two, uh, in there we talk about this thing called brain drain, or worrying about the proliferation uh, of nuclear weapons expertise, the fundamental science collaboration, which quite frankly, they were the ones that brought us to the point where we could cooperate. And then we ended with a rather interesting uh, set of papers on stockpile stewardship and also to look to the future. And as you can see from here, uh, this thing has grown, two volumes, about 80 papers from various authors, about half Russian, half American, 100 authors, two volumes, and about 1,200 pages. So we're fortunate enough uh, that the Los Alamos Historical Society, and particularly uh, Bath Tabro Publishing, ha has agreed uh, to publish uh, the books. And I would say we're getting close enough with the help of people like Sharon Snyder, Eileen Patterson, uh, and a number of others, uh, that we're shooting for an April date for publishing these two volumes. So obviously tonight I can't take you through all of these sections, through all of the papers, and so instead what I thought I would do is sort of set the context, first set the tone of what was there, tell you a little bit uh, about the laboratories, and then focus on what the laboratories uh, actually uh, contributed. So in, in terms of this sort of the end of the Soviet Union and what gave us the opportunity to work together, it really all started in 1985, uh, and namely uh, when Mikhail Gorbachev was elected uh, as General Secretary uh, of the Communist Party, and he replaced the, what we could call the geriatric uh, generation. You know, Brezhnev was there for 18 years. By the end, 
I'm not sure he was quite uh, there uh, in person, but he still ran the Soviet Union. Antropov uh, took over in Brezhnev Tide. He was there like for 18 months. Uh, and then uh, Konstantin Chernenko uh, was there for about a year. Uh, and then Gorbachev took over. And if Gorbachev had the realization that the Soviet Union, as it was configured, just couldn't continue to exist the way it was. So he introduced what's called glasnost and perestroika. Glasnost, sense of openness, you know, very different than what the Soviet Union uh, actually practiced. And perestroika, he realized the economy was in difficult, difficult straits, straits and it had to be restructured. And restructured away from military expenditures to worrying about the economy uh, and the people. And he set in motion a set of changes uh, that six years later wound up as the end of the Soviet Union. The way that we experienced and saw that first, at least when it really came to my attention, uh, was the summit uh, of Reagan and Gorbachev at Reykjavik uh, in Iceland, October 1986. And I must say that Reagan, you know, as much as he was very hardcore conservative, uh, and of course started out his uh, presidency uh, with talking, giving the speech about the evil empire, but he recognized very quickly that that world had changed when Gorbachev came there. So Gorbachev reached out and Reagan grabbed his hand, in essence. And so at Reykjavik, they came very close to eliminating nuclear weapons. But they didn't because Reagan insisted on keeping the Strategic Defense Initiative Star Wars. However, they did agree that actually they would try to ratify this thing called the Threshold Test Ban Treaty, Nuclear Pest, uh, Test Ban Treaty. Uh, and Reagan coined this term of trust but verify. And in essence, as I will explain later, that's where the laboratories came in on the verification end of that. But Reykjavik was just the beginning. Then things happened in incredible speed succession. And that is the top two photos of the Berlin Wall coming down in November of 1989. And in essence, Gorbachev let it go. To me, that was particularly surprising because I grew up in Austria and there was East and West Germany and I thought never the East and West would meet. And so it was just, it was an incredible happening. In the 1980s already, uh, the Polish uh, solidarity movement, uh, and in essence, uh, in the end, the Russians really didn't crack down on them they, the way they did uh, previously in places like Hungary uh, and Czechoslovakia. Uh, and then particularly in 1989, in the Baltics, they formed what's called the Human Wall. And it is hands across the three Baltic states of Lati Latvia, Lithuania, uh, and Estonia. Uh, and even though at first the Soviets tried to crush, eventually Gorbachev even backed off from that. And then, as they got to 1991, and Gorbachev was clipping along, sort of opening things up, still trying to keep the Soviet Union together, the hardliners, and particularly Gennady Yanayev uh, and some of the rest uh, of the Politburo, while Gorbachev was vacationing down at his dacha in Saria in the Crimea, they put him under house arrest uh, and essentially tried to replace his government. So an attempted coup. They took away the nuclear suitcase, a thing that carries you know, all of the codes for the nuclear weapons. However, Boris Yeltsin stood tall uh, in Moscow. He was the president of the Russian uh, Republic uh, of the uh, Soviet Union. And indeed, three days later, August 21st, Gorbachev was allowed to come back to Moscow took the Soviet Union back over, but it was the beginning of the end. In essence, he was done. But as you might imagine, you know, what the world went through at that time, you know, thinking that the president of the Soviet Union lost the nuclear suitcase, you know, they took it away from him. Just imagine the world was on edge. It's one of the finest hours of American diplomacy, as far as I'm concerned, and that is President Bush the first uh, actually, f first he signed the START one, the Strategic Arms Reduction Treaty, just before the, the attempted uh, coup. And then after the coup, he came back with Gorbachev, and there's this famous phone call, a phone call is now declassified, where he calls Gorbachev on the 27th and essentially tells him, 
look, I'm willing to take unilateral steps to do things like take all US nuclear weapons off the surface ships and a number of other things that take a number of nuclear weapons off alert. I'm doing it unilaterally. But Mikhail, I would certainly appreciate if you might do something in return. And Gorbachev said, for those of you who have ever been to Russia, you know this term, in principle, George, I agree. Uh, and indeed, a few days later, on October 5th, Gorbachev did agree, and he made reciprocal measures. And so all of a sudden, that nuclear concern at least tapered down some as to what would happen to Soviet Union. And then, interestingly enough, the US Congress got into action in a very big way. Uh, on top, what you see is actually two people, Ash Carter on the left and Bill Perry on the right. Ash Carter was at Harvard uh, at the time. Uh, and it's one of those cases where universities or non-governmental organization can actually step in and make a substantial difference. And that is the folks at Harvard wrote this report uh, that was called Soviet Nuclear Fission. And that is what's going to happen to the control of the nuclear arsenal if the Soviet Union dis, uh, disintegrates. And uh, in the bottom picture, you have uh, Richard Luger, a senator from Indiana, uh, on the left, and Sam Nunn uh, on the right. And they wanted to craft legislation to actually take the essence of that idea that actually now you'd have to go ahead and reach over that divide and cooperate. Uh, in order to deal with these new threats that you're going to have with nuclear things getting out of the control uh, of the Russian government. And they crafted what was called this cooperative threat reduction legislation, or we just refer to it as Nunluga. Uh, and that was nine, nine, November 1991 when they, in essence, crafted the legislation was passed uh, in, 19, uh, in December of 1991. The reason I show Bill Perry uh, he was at Stanford University at that time, and together uh, with Ash Carter and also with David Hamburg uh, from the Carnegie Corporation, they're the ones that sat in, in Luger's and, and, uh, uh, and Nunn's uh, uh, Senate offices to convince them that this is the right thing to do and help craft the legislation. And, and so, uh, and very interesting, very good book by David Hoffman called The Dead Hand, where he describes sort of the last days of the Soviet Union as to what actually happened. Turns out he was in Moscow at the time. Uh, and in his book, he states that Nunn and Luger, they helped Russia and the other former Soviet republics cope with what he calls an inheritance from hell. And that is with that whole nuclear enterprise that they inherited from the Soviet Union. And that inheritance in hell, in essence, I try to catch in shorthand. And that's what the rest of the talk is all about. The inheritance in hell, the way the US looked at it, was loose nukes, loose nuclear materials, loose nuclear people, and loose nuclear exports. So those are the four loose nuclear things. And the, the essence then was, so what happened? And how did one deal with this? So as the US looked at this, the entire Russian nuclear complex back 1991, 1992, all we could see was nothing but danger, no benefits. So all of the US government programs were targeted at prevention and elimination. You know, prevent proliferation, prevent the brain train of people uh, drain going someplace else, eliminate nuclear weapons. That was the US government's push. So let me just put some numbers on, on what these loose things mean. Uh, and it certainly was an enormous challenge at the time of dissolution, which was December 25th, 1991. Oops. Loose nukes, they had about 40,000 nuclear weapons, as best as we know at the time. 40,000. And of course, the smallest were like the ones at Hiroshima and Nagasaki, you know, many much larger. Nuclear materials, the bomb fuel, plutonium, highly enriched uranium. If you can even imagine that, 1.4 million kilograms. It takes less than 10 kilograms of plutonium to make a bomb, a few tens of kilograms of highly enriched uranium. And just imagine how many bombs worth of material. People, 
In the end, there were one million people in the Russian nuclear complex, Soviet nu nuclear complex, and not all the nuclear weapons, nuclear uh, power, nuclear weapons. And then exports, of course, the concern was that they had such a huge complex and, and the economy was in chaos. Because when the Soviet Union dissolved, it was the first time in history you know, that a country with the capability of destroying the world just went into political and economic freefall. It's institutions, institutions changing, everything changing. And so this is what I mean, that it had the making of a perfect nuclear storm. Okay, for those of you who need to leave early, I'm gonna give you the bottom line right now, and then I'll spend the rest of the time to develop how we did it. So, loose nukes. Looking back now, you know, from this year, 2015, 2015 I picked because it's 30 years after Gorbachev, there were no loose nukes. And maybe there's one some, someplace out there, but certainly nothing has, been, uh, not, nothing has been found. There were no loose nukes. Nuclear materials, in the early 90s, there were some reports of some leakage of highly enriched uranium. Uh, some Russians were trying to sell some plutonium, even in Prague and in, in Munich. Frankfurt, but in the end, very, very little from that 1.4 million kilograms. Absolutely amazing. Loose nuclear people, in the end, there really was no brain drain. It wasn't any worse than from the United States, and it's stable now. And the nuclear exports, uh, there were a few problems in the 1990s as far as uh, some activities with Iran, but the bottom line is also just not much, and again, not worse than, I would say, the United States. So this is absolutely amazing, you know, that 30 years later, none of these things which could have destroyed, or at least changed the world the way that we knew it, did not happen. So why? You know, that, that's the question. Uh, and here's my view, and more or less, that's the view we try to develop in the book. You know, first and foremost, the most important thing, we might pat ourselves on the back and say non luga and we gave money to the Russians, we helped them. But in the end, the single most important reason are the Russian nuclear workers, their nuclear military related people, their nuclear leadership. They are the, they are the most important. They were professional, patriotic, dedicated, responsible. And like all Russians, you know, willing to endure hardship. And those of you who were there in Sarov and Snezhinsk and the other places, you saw how they lived. You know, they told you when we asked them, when was the last time you got paid in 1998? They said six months ago. Now, it was a very difficult time. But then second, this was also a time, as I said earlier, of really enormous US diplomacy. I think very effective. President Bush, the first, his nuclear initiatives. Nanlugar, visionary legislation. President Clinton signed this thing called Presidential Decision Directive 47, where actually in the mid-90s he said, you know, it's important that both of our countries actually are able to take care of their stockpile. Make sure those stockpiles are reliable, they're safe and secure. It's in our best interest if we do that. That allowed us to do some of the very delicate work we did to, with the Russians on nuclear weapon safety and security. And then, you know, within the DOE and those of us who worked uh, within the DOE system, uh, one person really stands out, and that's Charlie Curtis. He was Deputy Secretary uh, of Energy. And, and he's the guy who gave us the first few dollars to sort of reach across. And then there were a number of, of other government figures, even though, as most of you who've worked for the DOE, with the DOE, we have lots of complaints about the Department of Energy, we have lots of complaints about its people, but there were some stellar stellar people who made it possible, because in the end, what I'm gonna tell you, scientists did, engineers did lots of terrific things, but you could only do it if you also had the support from the government. Charlie Curtis was there. Uh, later on, actually, Vic Reese was there in terms of stockpile stewardship. Bruce Gottemiller helped enormously. Ernie Moniz was there during the Clinton administration. Now he's Secretary of Energy. Linton Brooks, many of you know, and a number of others. And then what I haven't read, and that's what the story is all about, is the scientific community did step in just in time with this thing we call lab to lab. Scientist to scientist, engineer to engineer, people to people. 
And so the role of those scientists, and particularly the human dimensions, and that is the relationships that were built to allow us to do these things. Now, let, let me just go briefly uh, and um, go more specifically to Los Alamos, because we played a big role uh, in the Russian uh, lab to lab program. Uh, and I just take it back, because as some of my colleagues here in the front, know, uh, front row particularly know, uh, it was, and Buck Thompson knows for sure, uh, it was 30 years ago, uh, January 15th, that I took over as director uh, of Los Alamos National Laboratory. And it was an exciting first year. You know, Graham Rudman, uh, Balanced Budget Act, uh, 13 days after I took over the Challenger accident. Then somebody came and told me, you've got this spy in your X division. So we had the one holy affair. Then we had Chernobyl blow up on April 26th. And then Gorbachev and Reagan get together and say, let's get rid of nuclear weapons. That's a pretty exciting first year. <laughs> but I was ready. <laughs> and as you can see, I was prepared. So this happened right, you know, sort of during my rookie year and the first couple of years of directorship. And it was an exciting time. So as we looked into the, and finally got to understand the Soviet nuclear complex, it was huge. As I already told you, they had 40,000 weapons, they had more than 100,000, lots of materials, lots of people. Their complex was enormous. You know, we had one Rocky Flats th that could make plutonium pits, they had at least three. They had four weapons assembly uh, plants, we had one uh, in, in Amarillo at Pantex. Uh, they had fantastic laboratories that I'll tell you more about in just a minute. Uh, and as I told you, uh, one million people. One of the most immediate things that happened when the Soviet Union broke up into 15 republics, uh, actually there were lots of weapons left, uh, the old Soviet weapons in Kazakhstan, in Ukraine, and in Belarus. Uh, actually Ukraine had the third largest nuclear arsenal in the world behind uh, US and, and Russia. And this was an effort that was mostly government, so government to government. And Bill Perry, when he was Secretary of Defense, uh, was the per and along with Ash Carter, he was Assistant Secretary. Uh, they really did a fantastic job of getting those three countries to send those nuclear weapons back to Russia. Nowadays, people ask, was it a good idea? Heavens, yes, it was a good idea, uh, because that was an inheritance from hell, to be left with the weapons and not with the ability to actually take care of them. And so this non cooperative threat reduction uh, program, you can see on the right side, lots of things. Cutting up blackjack bombers, cutting up the missile silos, bringing back some of the highly enriched uranium, uh, taking the tunnels out at the Semipalatinsk Soviet nuclear test site, which was then uh, uh, in the Republic of Kazakhstan, uh, and closing up the tunnels, trying to uh, figure out a way to take the highly enriched uranium uh, and to downblend it for uh, nuclear power reactors, uh, or taking the plutonium and burn it. We've been very successful in the first, this so-called HEU, LEU program, not so successful in plutonium. But what this is all about is the lab to lab program, and that is the scientists going over there. And as Paul White told you, uh, I was indeed uh, over there with John Knuckles uh, on February 23rd, uh, 1992. However, the reason we were actually able to make good progress, quick progress, was because of this trust but verify. Uh, and that is, we had to get together and the idea was that the, the Soviet scientists would come to Nevada and essentially on site do a measurement, verification measurement of a nuclear device that we would blow up uh, uh, down under the desert. And then, and that's what happened here on August 17th, 1988. And then our scientists went over to Kazakhstan and we did the same thing over there. And we were able to demonstrate that the seismic measurements were good enough to be able to actually verify this threshold test span treaty. Uh, and, do, and it turned out then it became insignificant because when the Soviet Union fell apart and there were nuclear testing moratoria, then it didn't matter that much anymore. But the most important thing was that we got together. And actually, I start the book uh, with my description of how I felt when I sat in the control room at Mercury at Nevada test site 
with a cross for me being the leader of the Russian delegation who later became Secretary, uh, the Minister of Atomic Energy, Viktor Mikhailov. And what it was like to have those guys in our test site, you know, in 1988. And so we got to know each other well enough, working for months at a time, and particularly the Los Alamos scientists who work closely with the Russians. And that's what developed those personal relationships that allowed us to make progress. And in fact, this guy Mikhailov, who wrote his own books, uh, and they were called I'm a Hawk, uh, several editions. And he said he'd always dreamed of seeing how US experts work at the Nevada test site. He was there. He says, I can tell you that they're excellent experts, very friendly, very warm people. And then he added, we have cut a window into their hearts as well. And for those of you who knew Mikhail, he was one tough hombre, I mean, really tough hombre. And for him to talk about windows into hearts, it just shows you how deep those personal relationships actually went. And it was Mikhailov then who, because after that uh, monitoring and verification work, then they all went to Geneva. And actually Paul Robinson, you know, who had been at Los Alamos a long time, became the ambassador uh, for those Geneva testing talks. And he did a splendid job uh, in Geneva working with the Soviets to work out all of the details uh, of, the, uh, of the language that would allow us, allow the Senate to ratify uh, the treaty which it eventually did in 1990. That treaty was signed in 1974. And while our scientists were in Moscow for one of the technical sessions, uh, Mikhailov said, hey, why don't you guys come out? I'll take you out to Sarov, you know, their Los Alamos, their secret city, which at that time was not on the map of any of the Soviet Union maps. And he took them out there, and for those of you now, th these guys were just absolutely fantastic. Here's Don Eilers, here's Don Westervelt, and they're sitting there in a tent inside the fence, you know, in, in Sarov. Uh, and here is a big bonfire. So in August, they actually went out to the Soviet Livermore, and then in October uh, to the Soviet uh, Los Alamos. And then I'm, I'm gonna show you this, a video. And it's a video that the people that we call it Vinia for Arzama 16, for those of you who remember the old days, it's a video that they took during that first visit of Eilers and Westerfeld and company. And then they took this video, and I'll show you a few more parts of that, and they sent it to me in 1993. So hopefully uh, this, you'll be able to hear this. of the team of American experts on verification of nuclear tests with NEV Azama 16 a secret nuclear site took place on the 13th of October 1990. The delegation consisted of the scientists from Los Alamos National Laboratory. The program of the visit included familiarization with the town, the scientists... That's Don Eilers of the Institute in the Sphere of Inertial Fusion. <laughs> so the mouth was wide open. <laughs> One couldn't do without traditional Russian hospitality that gave pleasure to the guests in spite of cool autumn weather. That's the Russian Oppenheimer. So, then uh, shortly thereafter, and as Paul had indicated, uh, in uh, December 1991, I managed to convince the Secretary of Energy, uh, and that is James Watkins, uh, to actually allow for an exchange visit of laboratory directors, because the Russians had indeed been proposing not only visits, but actually specific scientific collaboration uh, with us. Because there were people like Max Fowler, who did some fantastic things here, related to high magnetic fields uh, and what's called magnetic accumulation or compression. Uh, and they had these counterparts over in Russia. We were better in some parts, they were better in others. The Russians wanted to work together. And so I kept going back to the Department of Energy and I couldn't get anywhere until uh, Admiral Watkins said yes. And so indeed, then by February of 1992, 
Uh, we had the Russians uh, on the left at Livermore, uh, at the Novaleza, uh, and then uh, on the bottom here at Los Alamos. And then in February, uh, John Knuckles and I uh, went uh, to Sarov, and this is just the arrival uh, on the tarmac, uh, and the uh, guy about to shake my hands is Yuli Hariton. Uh, we call him the Russian uh, Oppenheimer. And so here is that. The director of Los Alamos National Laboratory, Secret Hacker, and the director of Loris Livermore National Laboratory, John Knuckles, together with. Do you see that bear hug? I didn't lose my clearance because of that bear hug at least. Was very satiated. Millions and discussions of specific scientific and technical problems with the leading scientists and specialists of the air. For those of you who know, that's George Miller, John Emily, John Shainer. We not only built uh, on the JVE, but in the book we also give credit to the fact that there were other scientists who came long before us, who had reached across to the Soviet Union. Uh, just uh, Sid Drell is on the upper left, uh, Pif Panofsky, and then what we at Los Alamos think an unlikely person like Tom Cochran from the NRDC, uh, the Natural uh, Resources Defense Council. These folks reached across to the Soviets quite a while before some of the paths. People like John Holdren, who's now the president's science advisor, Frank Von Hippel, uh, Marty Hellman, one of the, the uh, Stanford people, and uh, uh, Dave ha Havemeister. We owe a lot to them. We try to carry that. Uh, were you able to hear in the back okay? Given his assessment of the visit, Secret Hacker said, as we speak and as we exchange ideas, we find that our problems are so similar. Keep your eye on that guy. I'm going to tell you who he is. Our countries and for our people. So I come here with a very happy heart. So now to be able to work with you jointly to make the whole world a much safer place. So I drink and have you raise your glasses to our fellowship and to our working together. That person, Thurman Talley, you'll appreciate that. Richtmeier Meshkov. That's Yevgeny Meshkov. So he's, he's one of the Russians who just did this fantastically beautiful work of understanding the instability of the interfaces uh, when you have two different densities, sort of one shock loading into the other. And he wrote a beautiful piece for the book. It says, my, it's called My Discovery of America. So during that visit, the Russians gave me this journal to take notes. And so as I was working on the book, I started looking through this journal at the notes that I took, you know, lots and lots of pages. It was absolutely incredible of what they told us. And, and the scientific stuff they talked about was so incredible. The stuff that Max Fowler was doing, high magnetic fields, or what Meshkov was doing of trying to get pure fusion, you know, in cap it was just unbelievable. So at that time, I realized that we not only should work with the Russians, that we must work with the Russians. So that kicked us off. So during that visit, we went out from Sarov out to Snezhinsk, there Livermore, and we made a list of these are the things we should work on together. So they're everything from safety, security, for the transport dismantlement, pre uh, prevent proliferation, uh, prevent nuclear terrorism, nuclear uh, weapons emergency response, safety of nuclear weapons in the remaining stockpile, and protection and cleanup uh, of the environment at nuclear sites. So that's what we put together. When we went there, of course, we were told, don't sign anything while, while you're over there. 
Well, it was just a protocol, you know? <laughs> so what we found out when we took this back and it went to the National Security Council at the White House, they said it did not exist, that it was thrown in the waste paper basket, as it turned out. Uh, but Admiral Watkins allowed us to begin to work together on scientific cooperation. Uh, and as I'll show you in a little bit, that started almost immediately. And over the next 20 years, most of these things became the blueprint uh, for what we did. So we were out there in front, but again, the Russians were pushing at least as hard as we were. So here are just some examples. So this was February, by June of 1992, we already did preparations for the first experiments in Sarov on the upper left. And then in September of 93, we did very successful experiments on creating these high magnetic fields. Uh, and here's Bob Brynowski uh, in uh, one of the trailers. And here's a successful experiment where Sasha Bikov, the Russian, actually bear hugs and lifts up uh, uh, Steve Younger off the ground. So what I'm going to work through now very quickly is so why, you know, why did this happen? And I'll put it uh, with this as the background. So from the US standpoint, I already told you, there were the four loose problems. Uh, and certainly from our standpoint, you know, of, of a Los Alamos, it was curiosity. We had enormous curiosity. What are these guys like? How good are they really? On the Russian side, you know, they wanted to end the isolation. Because before the Second World War, they were part of the great schools of European physics. You know, Yuli Hariton, their Oppenheimer, actually almost crossed paths with Oppenheimer at Cambridge. You know, he was Sir Ernest Rutherford's PhD student. So these guys, they all go back to the same roots. And yet, you know, from the Second World War on, they were isolated. They wanted to pay their people, because they couldn't anymore, mitigate the nuclear dangers. There was hope just by working with us, gave their scientists hope. And then they also had a sense of this global responsibility. But what was very important, and I think it was more difficult for our government to understand, you know, these, they were the elite. They were the Soviet elite. And they wanted to do things. They wanted to create, to discover, to build something together. They wanted to do something positive together. So in this book, I try to capture, so what was really different about Lab to Lab, you know, these scientists working together? Well, the first thing was boots on the ground. You, you know, we got there. Our people were there. They were behind the fence. They talked to them. They had dinner together. And you'd learn what their issues were. And what we learned was, you know, this inheritance from hell. That's not the way they looked at it. Nuclear weapons, they looked at as the guarantor of their sovereignty. Nuclear materials was an economic resource and a national treasure. Plutonium was for their grandchildren. You know, not what Hazel O'Leary said, you know, that you better bury that stuff, it's terrible. Nuclear science engineers, they looked at them as the engine for their economic recovery. And nuclear exports, it was one of those things that was actually high-tech export instead of exporting oil and gas. So for them, it was a gift from heaven. So you can imagine if you're going to structure a cooperative program, if all you're doing is focusing on elimination and prevention, you're not going to couple. And that's why we differed. We understood this. We were there. We heard them. So that's, I've already essentially said it. The second one is cooperate to do good, not just prevent. Discover, build, do something. And then, unlike most government parties, we were quick, we were flexible. And the Russians like concrete results. Don't just come and talk. Let's get something done. So, for example, you know, here's Brody Anderson and, oh, Jackie Schlachter. Uh, over there, you know, they had suggested almost immediately when we were there in February, let's start doing things. They wanted to do a pulse power experiment by May of 1992. And again, by September, we, our people were over there. We were setting up experiments, did experiments over the next couple of years, and I'll show you in, in, in a while, as to how many experiments they really did and how they worked together. These were people like Irv Lindemuth, Bob Brynowski, uh, Brody Anderson, uh, and uh, uh, Goforth uh, uh, as well, and many others. 
So we got a view from the inside. So President Bush, the first, was worried about brain drain. You know, the Russians are going to go sell their capabilities to Iraq, to Iran, or to North Korea. You have to understand the Russian people. There was no way they were going to go and sell their capabilities. So the brain drain turned out to be, you know, and sure, they, they were stressed. It was difficult for them. But they're used to suffering, and they were patriotic. The partnership, and this essentially was done by Steve Younger and company, who took over uh, when I asked them uh, to set up, to help set up the relationship with the Russians for a joint experiment. Side by side as equals, and step by step. Because actually the Russians worried at that time that the Americans come in and sort of cherry pick their technologies. And we tried to tell them, no, we're, we're going to work with you. We're going to do things together. And then, you know, we were not trust but verify. This was a new way of arms control, a new way of scientific diplomacy that I like to call trust and benefit, and benefit both sides. So it's not but, it's and, it's working together. And then what was also interesting, and I try to describe that in the book, uh, is it was a window of opportunity. If you look back, you know, we at Los Alamos, uh, they were privileged over there, no question. We were privileged uh, over here. We were enormously privileged because the government supported us. We had bipartisan support from the Congress during the Cold War because we had to keep those big bad Soviets at bay. Well, when the Soviet Union went away, we weren't quite as privileged anymore. But this was right after that time, and we still, the laboratories had enormous impact uh, in, uh, in Washington, D.C. And we were still run by the University of California. You know, Al Nareth did not go with us uh, to Russia. It was John Knuckles and myself who reported to the president of the University of California. And David Gardner told me, you go do what's right for the country. So we were willing and we were able to take chances at the time. On the Russian side, similarly, there, there was a window uh, of opportunity. And, and that is their ministry was taken over by this guy Mikhailov, who was there at the joint verification experiment. He had a direct line to Yeltsin. And he, in essence, made the decision to allow us to come over. So we had this window of opportunity where we were able to make progress uh, quickly. So that's, in essence, of what Lab to Lab is all about. We then also cover how eventually it sort of went away. You know, because that window of opportunity went away. And eventually, you know, the Russians also decided, from the standpoint of their security services, that, you know, for them, security service, we were always a risk. But for the rest of the nuclear complex, they understood the benefits. And by the time the Russians, you know, got back on their feet economically around 2000 or so, uh, then the security services started to take over. So lab to lab started to decrease. And then, of course, in the last couple of years, we've had additional uh, problems. We were also lucky during that time, I already told you, that we really had people with vision in the Department of Energy uh, who helped us out. So in the end, then, as one looks uh, back as to what was accomplished, you know, nuclear weapons, materials, workers, infrastructure, nuclear terrorism, scientific research. The reason I have nuclear energy and environmental issues in gray uh, we never stepped up from the American side, never really stepped up to do as much as the Russians wanted to do. In my opinion, that's a pity. We missed a good opportunity, but there are a whole number of reasons, uh, including uh, that the Clinton administration, of course, was not you know, terribly positive uh, on nuclear energy, especially the vice president, uh, Mr. Gore. And then in addition, uh, the Clinton administration was concerned about what the Soviets and that time then the Russians were doing in Iran. However, that's what we did, and we had a great spirit uh, of cooperation. So just to give you some examples, uh, for the loose nukes, safe, secure dismantlement, uh, and I already mentioned warhead safety and security. That's what was important. There were things like, uh, and by the way, this all three laboratories, uh, they played an extremely important role. Uh, so Sandia, for example, provided Kevlar blankets you know, for those Russian weapons that had to come back from Eastern Europe and then from the other republics. Because the concern was, you know, suppose they were ambushed by somebody, you know, they shoot at the weapon and one of those goes off. So Sandia had a lot of 
experience in how to transport nuclear weapons safely. Uh, they worked with them. One of the uh, interesting uh, exchanges, and, and John Remler uh, knows about this, uh, uh, he and other colleagues were there actually discussing one of the biggest problems that you have when nuclear weapons come back. They don't quite look exactly the same as when you send them out because things change, they age, and especially this stuff has got a lot of nasty stuff in there. You know, not only plutonium and other things, but high explosives, you know. Uh, and so the Russians were saying they're having a heck of a difficult time with all these weapons coming back as to how to get these parts apart. And then somebody from Livermore said, oh, we got this figured out, just use this solvent, you know, DMSO, dimethyl sulfoxide. And the Russians came back and said, you have given us a gift after they saw how well it worked. So you can imagine, we actually work together on things like how you take a nuclear weapon apart. As Sandia did a beautiful job on this thing called Tobos. Essentially, it was an in integrated end-to-end -end, uh, testing and advanced uh, security system. Worked very closely with them. On nuclear materials, Los Alamos particularly played uh, a lead role uh, because we had so much experience uh, in uh, what we call MPCNA, Materials Protection Control uh, and Accounting. So we worked very closely with them. The U.S. helped them build the storage facility. We worked with them on these issues. Uh, in the end, uh, during the Soviet days, uh, we said mostly that their system was one of guns, guards, and gulags. Uh, and that is that, you, you know, grave consequences if you tried anything. Well, you know, in, in this country, we always had to have technology to back up uh, uh, the, the human part of that. And we worked very closely uh, with the Russians. Uh, I actually signed the first agreements uh, with all uh, three uh, of their laboratories. Um, uh, the, the two VINIF, their Los Alamos VINITIF, uh, their Livermore, and then actually the Korchatov Institute, which was on the civilian side. Uh, we work with them uh, on the nuclear materials part because it is so important with this one and a half million kilograms. Uh, what people didn't understand, just how hard it is. Nuclear weapons, you can put a serial number on. Well, nuclear materials, you don't. They're in acid columns, they're everywhere. They're in waste, they're everywhere. So how do you protect them? Uh, we work very closely uh, with them. And this is just a map you know, of, of the former Soviet Union. They were everywhere. You know, absolutely everywhere, over the 11 time zones uh, of the Soviet Union. So there were people here at Los Alamos, uh, Mark Mullen, who we actually sent uh, to Washington to help run the DOE program, people like Ron Augustson uh, and many others who helped out on this. And then as Jake Turin knows here, he's inherited this, uh, this the uh, interesting problem of the semi polytense nuclear test site. I gave a talk on that uh, here uh, in this room uh, a few years ago in 2000, January 2013. Uh, this was the issue where they had this huge test site. They did all of these things, underground nuclear tests, experiments, lots of things. And then in January of, 2000, uh, of 1992, 25,000 Russian soldiers left, went back to Russia because now this was independent country of Kazakhstan. And the question is, what did you leave behind? And we were finally allowed to tell that story of how we worked with them from this laboratory. I went over to Russia. My colleagues here helped and supported me in many, many ways. And we, in the end, we got the Russians to come back to Kazakhstan to the test site uh, and uh, to essentially take care uh, of that problem. The reason they needed taken care of, because that was the guard gate you know, to the test site. And those trenches that you see were what the Kazakhs call copper cable thieves. Okay, they were looking for copper and they may have found plutonium. You know, not a good deal. It was actually the Russians first said, we're not going back when I told them, what did you leave behind? When I showed them these photos after I went to Kazakhstan, the Russians said, we're going to have those people who did the experiments for you and you can talk to them tomorrow. And they did. And the book contains this wonderful story from Viktor Stepanyuk, one of the key uh, Russians who's been working on this problem since uh, 1999, where he said, in, in essence, you know, uh, we prevented unauthorized non-industrial, that means non-legitimate use, uh, extraction of about 100 kilograms of weapons-grade plutonium dispersed all over that test site. 
you know, absolutely incredible if you think about it. And it was the scientists that went out, the government gave us money, they supported us. It was really critical that they did so, both the Department of Energy and the uh, Defense Threat Reduction Agency. But it was the scientists who made that happen. In this case, both Russians, Kazakhs, and Americans. And in fact, for those things, the personal relationships matter. Here's the, uh, on, on, the uh, on your right, this is the director of the Russian Los Alamos, and that's me. In Kazakhstan, riding on President Nazarbayev's horses. That was part of the deal of bringing uh, Radi Okayev back uh, to Kazakhstan. And then, I love this photograph, because Phil Hamburger uh, took over the, uh, the semi-Palatinsk work. Uh, and when he wanted to take Yuri Stiachkin, who was the key senior person, uh, out to dinner, Stiachkin said, ah, let's not go to dinner. And for those of you who've been to Russia, you know this story. Why don't we just bring some beer and vodka and some salami into the hotel room? Uh, you know, it's a lot more fun. And that's what they did here. And look at that grin on Hamburger's face. That's, and that Baltica beer, you know. I mean, that's personal relationships. That's what made it happen. And then they made me an honorary Kazakh also, you know, for, for helping out. So the brain drain, um, lab to lab scientific cooperation. The government had set up what's called the uh, International uh, Science and Technology Center. A uh, number of people here worked on what we called in initiatives for proliferation dimension, uh, prevention and nuclear cities initiative. Uh, all of those were essential. The experiments particularly were just important. I'd already mentioned these high magnetic flux uh, experiments. Uh, that's uh, one of them shown here. Uh, and then, I, I don't expect you to read all of those, but I just want you to know, those are the list of the joint experiments that were done. Absolutely incredible. They work, we had the Russians here for weeks at a time. We went over there behind the fence, you know, for weeks at a time. And all together, this effort, this is Irv Lindemuth, Bob Bernofsky and company, over those years, 400 publications and presentations together. Absolutely astounding of them working together. It was just splendid. And then in the plutonium world, since that was my own business, and then especially after I left the directorship in 1997, uh, I was so curious as to what they know uh, and what they did in plutonium. And it turns out uh, this lady is probably the world's premier plutonium metallurgist. And I happened to meet her through these two big guys uh, who were also fantastic scientists. But she did a number of experiments and some beautiful work that we eventually wrote up in Los Alamos Science. We call it the tale of two diagrams. Uh, and, and these are uh, technical aspects of phase diagrams for plutonium. You have to alloy or mix plutonium with something to make it behave in order to really make a decent bomb out of it. Uh, and we figured that out during the Manhattan Project and we thought we had it reasonably well figured out. But the Russian phase diagram from the first time they ever showed it was different than ours. Uh, and after I gave a presentation in Baden-Baden, Germany in 1975 at a scientific conference, they showed theirs and I said, well, those Russians don't know what they're doing. Well, I met Lydia Tipofeva. She explained it all in 1998. We had her here in Santa Fe in 2000. And in the end, it turns out the Russians were right. Uh, they were just smarter about it. They had more patience. It was incredible. So it was, you know, f and we had 14 annual workshops to compare notes on plutonium science. These uh, nuclear cities related initiative, we did everything with these guys from converting production space of like their uh, Pantex you know, assembly plant so that they could do civilian production. We did things related to an open computing center that we helped them build. Medical technologies, everything from uh, kidney dialysis uh, to various sulfur hexafluoride switches. Lots of things, nuclear exports, oops. Um, we work with them very closely. This was mostly government, uh, 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 government control, but very, very productive also. And, and our experts, people like Arvid Lundy, for those of you who know Arvid, work very closely with the Russians to help them build real export control regulations. Uh, and we had concerns about Iran, but they had a respectable uh, overall record. And then uh, near the end of the book, we have one chapter on stockpile stewardship, you know, which is our responsibility after all, and still is our most important responsibility. Now, this is a cartoon 
that Radi Ilkayev, my counterpart in Russia, showed during one of our meetings. And he said, this is what Stockpile's stewardship is all about. Yesterday, he had the old man, he had bombs, he had lasers, you know, he had the bombs, the computers, he had everything. Life was good. Today, this was 1999, well, the old man is sitting there trying to tell the youngster about how we used to have all of these things. And tomorrow, we're going to have this problem where the old man's picture is only on the wall, sort of crooked, and the young man's there scratching his head. What do I do with all these computers and lasers? You know, how, how can I take care of the nuclear weapons? And this, this is a fantastic chapter, actually, because the Russians wrote a few pieces uh, of sort of putting it in perspective as what the world is like today and why they need nuclear, worlds to, uh, why they need nuclear weapons today. At any rate, so what did we learn? Mutual trust, common interest, really important. Treat each other as equals. This was not, what we did was not a foreign aid problem. Side by side, shoulder to shoulder, they called it. Engage the Russians, have them identify the problem. Step by step, start small, and then grow from there. Get going quickly, do something concrete. And we convinced Washington, they convinced Moscow. You know, don't reach across the political uh, uh, spectrums. And then push the envelope. Because the governments are there to always slow you down. You know, they have to worry about all the consequences. They are worried about everything. And the scientists, they are always pushing. Now, you know, we might be sort of diplomatically or politically naive, but they're too constrained. And so you have to make sure that you push the envelope. So I already showed you this. They had 40,000 nuclear weapons, no loose nukes. That's remarkable. Very little leakage of nuclear materials. Essentially, you know, no brain drain, and it's stable now. Actually, I also, in the stockpile stewardship chapter, I actually trace how it's interesting enough, I won't, to get, in, I won't get into this here tonight, but how in 1992, those guys were on life support, and especially through 1998. And we were riding, you know, pretty hard. Today, things have flipped. They're in better shape today than they've been since the Gorbachev arena. And you know yourself, uh, we have our own struggles and concerns. President Putin has been out to Sarov twice in the last three years. Our president has not been uh, to a place like Los Alamos. Uh, and not that this is good, but they've emphasized and have increased the role of nuclear weapons in their security. We clearly have decreased. I think decreasing is the right way to go. But there are aspects of what you need to be able to do the stockpile stewardship. And that's part of the issue and part of the problem. OK, so then you know, to sort of wrap it, uh, get close to wrapping it up, why was there no perfect storm? Russian nuclear workers, professional, patriotic, dedicated, responsible. The US government, some really important initiatives. And then the scientific community stepped in just in time. The role of the scientists, the human dimension. We'll also, in this book, we'll cover the human dimension because I asked each of the Russians, each of the Americans, after you write what you did technically, give us a story. And so we have those stories. So we're going to intersperse those stories between the chapters and tell you what people said about either the Russians coming here or, or the Americans going down. So as we look, uh, at all of this today. No perfect storm. But as you know, things have gone downhill in the relationship between our countries. And so on the nuclear front, what I'm actually concerned about today, even though the, the Russians actually are significantly building their nuclear capabilities, but for the most part, they're building them back up because the 1990s was a disaster for them. So I myself am not particularly concerned about what the Russians uh, are building up. What I am concerned is because of the relationship having gone downhill so badly uh, in the last few years, and especially because of this, uh, of Crimea and then the eastern Ukraine. What I'm concerned about today is they go back to nuclear isolation. And it was Lev Ryabev who said, you know, we can't do that. I mean, in the end, if you look at the whole nuclear spectrum, 
You know, isolation brings problems. Cooperation helps to solve the problems. And so what I'm afraid today is there's issues of nuclear security, nuclear safety, and be it civilian nuclear, be it you know, military nuclear. Safety and security are not a destination. It's not some place that you get to and then you're done. It's a journey. You can never quit. And whenever you think you're there, that's when you're in trouble. So what we're afraid of today, they've made enormous progress in their whole complex. But when you're isolated, you fall back. And so you, you know, many of the papers, the Russian papers, wind up with saying, I hope we can get back together, you know, because it's so important. And actually, this is Levriabev, and he says, this is uh, in the most recent interview, July 9, 2015, our job is to convince our respective leadership that we must keep working together. The only alternative is suspicion, return to an arms race, and increased tension. And he essentially said, we must not go in that direction. In other words, don't go there. But that's not the way the Russian government is playing right now. And also, as far as I'm concerned, it's not the way the American government is playing that right now. <laughs> and so, you know, that's the situation we have today. So the hope that we have, you know, is can we make sure that instead, it's like these scientists, Radi Elkayev, who was my counterpart, and myself, instead of the politics. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to stop, and I'll be happy to try to answer your questions. Thank you. I'm going to let you handle this one. Steve Becker. Okay. Will your book be available in Russian? Uh, I'm sorry? Will your book be available in Russian? Oh, oh, the book. Oh, so. Mm -hmm. uh, so very good question. Actually, I left, I left that out uh, because to some extent, it's a sad story. So the idea of the book uh, five years ago uh, was that we would work together on the book, Russian articles, American articles. Uh, we would write the introductions and the overviews together. And then the book would be printed both in Russian and in English, the same book. So the idea was yes. And as we were going along getting these papers in, uh, we had them all translated. And we were ready to go. And then a year ago, uh, my Russian colleagues, uh, as we were talking on the phone, you know, trying to prepare for the book, uh, they said uh, it's, it's no longer possible to do one book. Uh, so politically, the situation had changed to the point where it was not good for them nor for their institutes. And now, now I'm adding my opinion. That's what they told me. Now I'm going to tell you it was not good for them or for the institutes to actually show that all these good things come from cooperation, because right now, that's not uh, uh, what Vladimir Putin uh, wants to hear. However, as you saw, I give so much of the credit to them. I mean, they were just fantastic as to what they did. So what they decided then, their comeback was to say, look, we know this story has to be told, uh, but we can't do it in one book. So what we're going to do, Oh, and by the way, they were going to print the book. So they actually were going to print the copies, both in, uh, in English uh, and in Russian. They were going to print it. So what they said we're going to do is we're just going to publish two books separately. Uh, and 90% of the content, all the papers that their people wrote, our people wrote, will be the same. But then what's happened, you know, if you get 80 papers, I mean, how in the heck do you make that readable? So in essence, uh, what I've done, for example, I have like 16 pieces in this book where I try to glue these different things together to try to explain the nuclear materials issue, the brain drain issue, and all of these things. Uh, and they were going to write their own introduction, and I write mine, and there would be a Russian book and an American book. And so that's, that's where we are right now. 
we're, as I said, we're almost there. We're you know, in the final editing stage, close to going to uh, graphic design and to printing. Uh, and they're lagging even on their, on their book. So I'm, I'm going to go back there. I didn't mention this, but I've been to Russia 50 times uh, in that time frame since 1990. I'm going to go there for my 51st time at the end of February uh, and, and actually try to um, give them all the material you know, that they need for their book. So, uh, but eventually, uh, we're also, uh, I had it on that one little slide, but I didn't touch on it. Uh, we're also, in addition to the book, we're going to have an electronic archive that will supplement the book because there's so many uh, of you, so many people at Los Alamos who also did things and we didn't call upon all of them. Uh, and so we're going to do it like a blog, ask them to contribute, put their stories, put their photos, put their videos into this electron uh, electronic archive. And we'll have it in there in Russian. So the Russians will have access. But we hope they're going to do the book. The idea was two books. Uh, right now, I'm not absolutely positive. Just to take advantage of you and switch the subject a bit, what do you think about North Korea today? I'm sorry, the what? North Korea. What's going on in North Korea? <laughs> <laughs> well, let me just say, the Russians are not in North Korea. <laughs> The Chinese are not in North Korea, as it turns out. So I just wrote a piece. Actually, I just wrote a piece on Iran. Uh, so don't ask me about Iran. But, so if, if you want to find out about Iran, Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists just carried a piece uh, of mine last week uh, about the deal and, and what the issue is. But so as North Korea, I, I did a piece for the uh, Stanford University CSAC website. Uh, and it was related to the issue of the hydrogen bomb. Uh, you know, so did they actually test the hydrogen bomb? So I'm, I'm just going to answer that question uh, and then maybe speculate a bit more. So of course, North Korea is very difficult to figure out. I've been there seven times. They haven't let me back in since 2010. Uh, so from all the things that we can figure out, what they tested was not what we'd call a two-stage thermonuclear device. Uh, the, the yield is somewhere between 10 and 15 kilotons of the thing that they did test. Again, since we're in Los Alamos, uh, you know the stuff. There's something that's a step shy of a, a full-scale thermonuclear device, and that's a boosted uh, you know, fission bomb. So we cannot rule out that, that they actually may have tested a, a, a boosted fission bomb, but it doesn't look like a two-stage uh, thermonuclear device. So. Uh, the, the way the newspapers played it is, of course, you know, a hydrogen bomb, they say, is a thousand times more powerful. Well, you know, that doesn't mean a whole heck of a lot. <laughs> if they set off 13 kilotons in New York City, it'll kill 350,000 people. You know, so you don't need, you know, 13 megatons. Uh, so, you know, possibly uh, they've played with the boosting. The, the most troublesome thing of what they did, since they did another nuclear test, that's their, their fourth, is they almost certainly made advances in how to miniaturize. And that's the real danger, is make them small enough you know, so you can put them on a missile, uh, and that's what, uh, uh, what increases the overall threat. My own feeling is still I'm not worried about being bombed by Kim Jong-un, uh, but nevertheless, um, what really worries me more is, you know, I've been tracking what they've been doing in plutonium production, highly enriched uranium production, uh, and uh, my view currently is that, you know, North Korea may have as many as 15 or 16 fission bombs of maybe a handful of plutonium, the rest of highly enriched uranium. Uh, and they could have, you know, 50 by the year 2020. And once you have that many, you know, that's no longer like a terrorist weapon. You've got all that material, you've got all those bombs, and then you can think of all the bad things that can actually happen in North Korea. So you combine that with them miniaturizing, uh, that's not good. The young man's not crazy. Uh, you know, Kim Jong-un is 31 years old. Uh, he's, as far as North Korea is concerned, you, you know, and having control of the system, he has control of the system. Uh, and so uh, my view there is, um, uh, you've got to talk to them. You've got to engage. Uh, and in, in 2008, when I came back, I, uh, and, you know, and I 
saw the appropriate secretaries of state and people in the NSC, and I said, look, the most important thing at this point is don't let it get worse. You know, actually work with the North Koreans, do whatever you need to do, you know, both from a carrot and a stick standpoint, but don't let it get worse. So in 2008, they maybe had a handful of bombs. And today it's gotten worse, and it keeps getting worse. So that's my concern about North Korea. Hmm? Actually, um, your slide with four loose examples that served as a driver for the, the effort you describe uh, in the context of a, of a government that's disassembling could easily be applied to Pakistan today. And yet there's no clear path as there might have been here with Russia to work those issues. Do you have any fears or why we can might thinking about that? So four loose nukes, okay. So uh, yes, I have ideas about Pakistan. I just met with the Pakistanis in Vienna in the first week in December. So I've been working with the Pakistanis for the last four or five years uh, precisely for those same reasons. Um, uh, the loose nukes, uh, you know, in Pakistani would worry about um, uh, takeover of the government. Mm -hmm. uh, the loose materials, uh, I worry a lot uh, because they've made a lot of highly enriched uranium and they're making more plutonium. And, and the loose people, uh, you worry some, the loose exports, that was AQ Khan. Uh, and so there's lots of reason for concern. Uh, so the, um, the, the good news, and I actually went to Pakistan, much to Nina's dismay, uh, last year in March uh, of 2015. Uh, and the, the good news is they have better control than I would have thought. Uh, the bad news is they live in a very dangerous neighborhood. You know, including, of course, their, their own country and, uh, and the terrorists. Uh, so in, in my own opinion, uh, actually, uh, the way things are today, uh, and then the Indians aren't helping, quite frankly. Uh, so uh, today in, in, South, um, in South Asia, y you have the greatest likelihood of a potential nuclear exchange uh, between India and Pakistan. Uh, Pakistan is building up, India is building up, uh, and so you have the potential. And then you also, you, you worry about the nuclear materials, the nuclear weapons. And so Pakistan, India is a very dangerous place. Uh, the United States is actually working with Pakistan uh, on several different levels. Uh, but it, it's very, very difficult to try to control the relationship or influence the relationship between India uh, and Pakistan. Uh, you know, it's one of those classic relationships is that India is so much bigger, its economy is so much better, its military is so superior that the Pakistanis feel the only out they have are nuclear weapons. And because they're concerned about the Indians coming over the border in case there's another terrorist attack on India, be it from whoever, is they're developing tactical nuclear weapons. Uh, and tactical nuclear weapons, you know, even though we played with those many years ago, that's really unsafe territory. And so in India, Pakistan is just a dangerous place. Uh, government is working it, but uh, something has to happen between India and Pakistan uh, to get them in a different direction. Singh, you spoke very eloquently to the importance of the relationships between the scientists on the two sides. And many of the scientists that were involved over that 30-year period have retired, are no longer with us. If we go quiet with Russia for another five, 10 years, many more of them will be retired. When you have a new generation that's trying to rebuild those relationships, what's your biggest point of advice to them to start that over again? So that's, that's an excellent question. It's actually one of my biggest concerns that Let's suppose we could get the governments back realigned to where they actually say, yeah, you know, you, these scientists did a nice job. Let's get them back on the job. How do you get them back? You know, back in those days, as I was trying to get across, you know, I mean, there was a sense of an enormous urgency 
there was also a sense of excitement, of adventures, you know, adventurism. Of, it, it, was an, it was incredible to go over there, you know, to see what that place is like. And so that, that sense of excitement is gone. The, the sense of the importance and the urgency, to some extent, is also difficult. Uh, and, and so it's going to be very difficult to regenerate that sort of enthusiasm uh, among the younger generation today. And so this is actually something that the government must now step in to try to regenerate. You know, for example, one of the simple ways to do this is people at Los Alamos, especially at Los Alamos National Laboratory, are still typically quite excited about the potential of nuclear energy or the potential of fusion, you know, for example. And th those guys, they've done so much more in nuclear energy than we have over the last couple of decades because we've slowed down. There is so much to learn. There's so many things you could do together. Those ideas they had about pure fusion, just go talk to Irv Lindemuth. You know, if he could, he could only talk to more of the young people to get them excited about this idea of magnetized target fusion, which comes from uh, the Russian work. If you could get the young scientists at this laboratory together with the Russian scientists, make it possible, you'd have to rekindle that spirit of excitement you, you know, to do good. That's what scientists like to do. We don't just like to prevent uh, things. Uh, and, and I'm afraid today you can't do that by yourself as a scientist anymore. That's why I tried to say we had this window of opportunity where things just, you know, the stars were lined up. They're not lined up anymore. And so somebody has to come and help us and push it in that direction. Uh, I've tried, uh, actually, you know, during the time of this Secretary of Energy, Ernie Moniz, we had a chance. But unfortunately, that's when the relationship, you know, when, when the Russians went into Crimea, you know, I mean, just that dashed almost everything. Then it made it worse going in eastern Ukraine. But the Secretary of Energy, Ernie Moniz, just told me that the Russians were exemplary in helping on this Iranian nuclear deal. Essentially felt it couldn't have happened without the Russians. The Russians really stood up and helped out. And so he actually expressed, you know, I've corresponded with Ernie. He, uh, Ernie was here at Los Alamos a long time ago as a postdoc. He knows this place very, very well. Um, and so there, there, there might be some hope. And if you'd have a person like that, uh, but the politics have to be somewhat better. So the, the bottom line is I'm, I'm really worried about how you rekindle the excitement uh, among our younger generation. So I know we work closely with the British, and you mentioned that we have been reaching out and you've been talking with the Pakistanis. What other efforts are going on with China and the other nuclear powers? Hey, Tom, could you help me? Did you hear that? What, what, is the, uh, what is going on with China and the other nuclear powers? You mentioned Pakistan. Oh, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah thank you. Yeah, I, I have difficulty hearing. Your voice is just fine, but not, not good enough for my electronically assisted hearing. So, so what about the other nuclear powers? So, uh, so let me just start with, with Russia. Generally, the things that are happening there are, are not good. Uh, and, and particularly the, uh, you know, the various actions they've taken to sort of rebuild their nuclear complex from the demise in the 1990s can actually be interpreted by lots of people in this country to say, hey, look, we've got to really rebuild our own nuclear arsenal. And so what the Russians are doing right now uh, doesn't, doesn't help. The, the Chinese, um, <clears throat> interestingly enough, uh, they have over the years believed in what they call minimal deterrence. And so the Chinese have a very small nuclear force compared to that of the Russians uh, and the Americans. And that for many years has been very good news. Uh, however, the Chinese also, if you watch their complex very closely, they've done a lot of things, particularly on the missile front and the delivery front, that again makes a lot of the people in this country quite nervous. So keeping an eye on the Chinese, I work, it turns out, I've been in China 25 times. I work with their nuclear weapons folks. Uh, right now, we have a terrific relationship with the Chinese. 
in trying to jointly assess Chinese technical people, jointly assess North Korea's capabilities. Very, very positive. There are many people here who've worked China problems like the, um, the Russia problems, nuclear materials control and accounting, nuclear safety. All of those things are very good. There's some concerns on sort of the strategic front uh, with China. Uh, UK and France, of course, we don't worry about. You know, they're more or less uh, in, in our corner. Uh, India and Pakistan, I've already told you. Uh, I'm particularly, quite frankly, I'm really concerned about India, Pakistan from, from many, many standpoints. You know, they, they both talk about a triad. So a, a triad is, you know, submarine launched, right? Missile launched, and then air delivered. Well, you know, submarine launched nuclear missile. That's tough stuff. If you look at the number of nuclear tests that those countries have had, uh, I really worry about how in the world they could possibly do that safely. Uh, so I worry a lot about uh, India, Pakistan. And then most of the other, you know, the small countries actually uh, in terms of, you know, potential nuclear countries, uh, quite frankly, that's gone in, in, in a good direction, even though we have all this upheaval in the Middle East. But, you know, I Iraq right now is not nuclear weapons. Uh, Syria, you know, Assad did play uh, with the potential of nuclear weapons by having North Koreans build them a, rea a reactor. The Israelis destroyed that, so Syria is out of the nuclear weapons business. Uh, Iran, for the time being, you know, my bottom line on the deal, it's a good deal to sort of set back uh, the Iranian nuclear program. You never, you can't wipe it out altogether if they decide sometime in the future. Uh, Libya, in terms of nuclear aspirations, uh, is gone. Uh, and you actually don't think about uh, many others. So in terms of the proliferation, some people will say, you know, we're at a tipping point. I don't really believe that we're a at a tipping point. So that comes then not to nuclear powers, but uh, the nuclear terrorism. And, and that's a, a significant concern. Uh, so that's where this, that's why this MPCNA, Materials Protection Control and Accounting, whatever nuclear materials you have, be they from a weapons program, be they from a nuclear energy program, keep them in control of the government. That's absolutely essential. That's very, very hard to do. Uh, so, and, and, and it's also hard to do as you get a greater expansion of nuclear power in the Middle East, for example. You know, that's where solar cells would be very nice, you know, in Saudi Arabia. Uh, so, so there are still, there, there, there are lots of, of serious issues uh, but the major issue right now in terms of the main nuclear powers is, is what is the U.S. going to do to actually have a reliable deterrent that can assure countries like Japan, South Korea, Germany that they don't have to build their own nuclear, uh, uh, their own nuclear weapons. And then China, uh, you know, hopes that it will stay on some course where minimal deterrence uh, is indeed. And, and then Russia somehow comes back around uh, and and not continue uh, to build up. Speaking of Romania, uh, oh, uh, I was going to ask your thoughts about the CTBT, uh, in particular, you know, stockpile stewardship and uh, your operational warhead and all kind of thing. But you also mentioned. India, Pakistan's limited number of tests. So one of the things that I would think is that CTBT could perhaps be very useful for preventing further development of programs. Uh, but I'm also curious, of course, as to your thoughts, since you are the expert on plutonium, as to whether or not that's really doable. OK, so, so the question was uh, about the CTBT, the Comprehensive Test Ban uh, Treaty. Uh, the, that, that's a treaty that during the Clinton administration, that was a centerpiece of Clinton administration, uh, the U.S. And, and President Clinton signed that in 1996. Uh, the Senate rejected ratification in 1999, and it's still not ratified in 2015. Uh, the Russians signed, and the Russians ratified, uh, actually. Uh, and the, um, uh, the Chinese signed, but have not ratified, because the U.S. has not ratified. I, I actually did a long study with, with uh, my colleague at Stanford, uh, former Secretary of Defense Bill Perry, uh, also very much assisted by, by Joe Martz here from the laboratory. 
And uh, the, the bottom line that we felt on the CTBT, uh, and particularly taking into account things like plutonium ages, uh, and whatever those reports are out there that plutonium is going to last 80 to 100 years and nothing's going to happen to it, I don't believe it. We have not demonstrated that that's actually the case. Uh, so when, when you don't test, you pay a price. I mean, that's just, that's all there is to it. Because in the end, you, you know, if you get too much confidence in your theoretical people, in your computational people, and you don't check on that, you get too biased towards the theoretical. And, and so the testing is very important. However, if you test, if the US doesn't ratify, then you have the problems that you just pointed out. So to whom is it going to be more important? The US has 1,054 nuclear tests under its belt. Russia has 715 nuclear tests. So from Russia, you know, that's about the same as the United States. China has 45. And I was just telling you, China's building up its missile. If China goes back and tests, that's not good for the United States. India and Pakistan have six each. If they go back and test, that's not good. North Korea now has four. So what it then turns out, even though you lose things by not testing, stockpile stewardship program is intended to have that loss of confidence be as slow as possible. And what you get in return uh, is the fact you don't have China going back and testing, India, Pakistan going back and testing. And again, the Russians, for the most part, it's like us. I mean, their testing would be to retain the confidence in what they have. And so when I was director of the laboratory, you know, my job was to make sure from a technical standpoint we're prepared to do the job. If you can't test, it takes away one of those things. And my job was only you know, to talk about the testing part. Now that I'm not at the laboratory and I'm at Stanford, I say as I weigh these two things, the ratification of the CTBT is very important. I'm a strong proponent of that. But the politics in this country didn't make it happen during Obama administration. He said in his Prague speech uh, in 2009, April 5th, that he's going to go for the ratification of the CTBT. Uh, and he's not resubmitted it uh, because the politics is such it's not possible. Uh, they're making, they're, they're considering making another attempt, but, but I'm not sure. Somebody has to actually stand up and say, they're, they're, you know, those proponents for the CTBT actually say, look, you've got computers, you don't need testing. We have more confidence in the stockpile than we had in 1992. I say that's baloney, that's just not true. I don't have more confidence today than I had in 1992. But there's the other side, what do you gain, you know, through the ratification? And that's a balancing problem. And somebody has to be able to say, and look, for this country, it is to the advantage of this country to go ahead and ratify. And besides, we're not testing anyway. You know, so we're not getting the benefits of tests anyway. And then we don't get the benefit of not ratifying. That's my opinion. One last question. <laughs> Cass, how are you? Cass walked the streets of Kazakhstan with me many times. It was a great trip. Yes. But about your book, it's coming out in April. How does one get a copy of this book? Well. <laughs> my good friend, Sher my, my, I'm sorry. Will you sign? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, my good friend Sharon Snyder, uh, who's here from Bathtub Row and has been helping us out on the copy editing, that, you know, she said, could you put in a little plug for the book? <laughs> and, and I said, well, you know, Sharon, I don't really feel comfortable doing that. <laughs> However, now that you open the door, Cass, <laughs> I think Sharon has a, has a sign up sheet over there. Is that right? If Heather's still back there, we do. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> okay, Heather from Los Alamos Historical Society. So we have a sheet here. And, and by the way, although I don't feel that badly about it, whatever, you know, a 1,200 page, two volume book about something as esoteric as this nuclear weapons stuff isn't going to make a lot of money. But whatever money it's going to make will be donated to Los Alamos Historical Society, okay? <laughs> <laughs>
I'll turn the time back over to Bishop Miller. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Ecker. We very much appreciate uh, you coming out this evening. Uh, certainly been very insightful for all of us, and we very much appreciate that. Uh, uh, we will uh, go ahead and uh, close out, and there are some refreshments here. Thank you all for coming. I uh, very much appreciate that. Uh, be safe in the parking lot. Thank you. Thank you.